You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. A Federal Judicial Center production. Basics of Employment Law for Law Clerks. Now from our studios in Washington, D.C., here is our moderator, Peter Zinnober. Hello, and welcome to this joint production by the Federal Judicial Center and the American Bar Association's section of Labor and Employment Law. Labor and Employment Law is one of the largest and fastest growing segments of the federal uh, district court docket, accounting for almost 10 percent of all civil filings in the year 2000. And federal question EEO cases made up more than 13 percent of all federal question cases. Only prisoner petitions represent a larger proportion of civil or federal question filings. The numbers in the appellate courts are even perhaps more impressive. There, EEO cases comprised more than one-fifth of all civil federal question cases decided after oral argument in the year 2000. And one last statistic. In 1990, more than 8,000 employment discrimination cases were filed in federal courts. But 10 years later, in 2000, more than 21,000 cases were filed, an almost 250 percent increase. Because of the growing importance of these cases to federal judges and therefore to their law clerks, we have gathered four of the nation's outstanding practitioners in this area to explore and explain some of the basic issues you are likely to encounter. They are Jana Howard Carey of Venable Bacher and Howard in Baltimore, Maryland, who represents employers. Wendy L. Kahn of Zwerdling, Paul, Liebig, Kahn and Wally in Washington, D.C., who represents labor organizations. Mark Dichter of Morgan Lewis and Bacchius in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who represents employers, and Richard Seymour of Leaf, Cabracer, Hyman, and Bernstein in Washington, D.C., who represents employees and civil rights organizations. The labor and employment section of the American Bar Association strives to achieve this kind of philosophical balance among the constituencies represented here in its programs, publications, and governance. Other members of the section include lawyers who represent government agencies that enforce labor and employment laws, as well as neutrals such as mediators and arbitrators. We are glad we can join with the Federal Judicial Center to provide a balanced analysis of this area of law to this year's class of law clerks. Thank you all for being part of the program. Wendy, I know that you and Jana are going to discuss some of the uh, subjects initially that cover the broad range of equal employment opportunity laws. Wendy, you're going to be covering uh, a range of uh, the EEO statutes, Title VII, the ADEA, and giving us a broad overview of coverage, of jurisdiction. And uh, Jana, you're going to be dealing with uh, two of the hottest topics in this area, sexual harassment and the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as certain selected issues that are, that are uh, uh, highly uh, relevant uh, in the last 12 months of decisional uh, reporting. So, Wendy, if you'll lead off for us and, uh, and cover a, a broad range of the EEO laws. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll first talk about Title VII of the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was amended in 1972, 78, and 91. And I mention that because the 1991 amendments were a series of amendments in reaction to a series of Supreme Court cases and uh, either reversing some of those cases, affirming them, or clarifying them. And you will hear reference, I think, uh, a lot in this presentation to the 1991 Civil Rights Act and uh, changes that were made. And as you research in this area, you should be careful because uh, cases prior to 1991 may or may not be good law in this field. And it's always important to, in Title VII to take a look at the 1991 amendments. Uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act uh, prohibits private employers with 15 or more employees, state and local government employers, the federal government, although with different uh, procedural rules. Um, and by the way, uh, in 1995, Congress passed the Congressional Accountability Act, which made Title VII and a number of other worker protection um, acts applicable to a number of congressional entities. Uh, there are, of course, exclusions. Uh, certain types of employees are not included, uh, but and certain types of employers are not included. Uh, 
but in general, it's a very broad coverage with Title VII. Uh, religious organizations uh, may discriminate solely on the basis of religion, um, as we'll talk a little bit about uh, later. Uh, employment agencies are also covered by Title VII. Labor organizations are covered by Title VII, and training programs are covered by Title VII. Title VII prohibits discrimination on the basis of race or color, and that covers all races, including whites. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of national origin. Uh, national origin means the basis of the country from which one's ancestors come, not the basis of citizenship. And the national origin uh, discrimination is subject to the BFOQ, or the Bonafide Occupational Qualification Defense, which we'll talk about later. Jana, uh, you, I think, have some additional information about the national origin. Right, Wendy. Um, it's actually a, a fairly broad protection because um, people are protected not only because of their country of origin or the country of their ancestor, or the country of origin of their ancestors, but also because they may have the physical or linguistic or cultural characteristics of a national origin group. So for example, the EEOC has promulgated, as it has in many areas that we're going to be talking about, guidelines that give us a little bit more information about how it interprets uh, this uh, protection as it administers Title VII. And those guidelines say, for example, that the protection of, against national origin discrimination extends to people who are discriminated against because of their marriage or association with people of a national origin group, even though the individual may not themselves belong to that group. Um, and to people who have a, a membership or association with an organization that is identified with or seeks to promote the interest of a special or national origin group. Like, for example, um, I believe there was a case some time ago involving a, a Chicano advocacy group where protection was extended to folks who were members of that group even uh, though they did not uh, have any national origin affiliation other than that. Also to people who are discriminated against because of their attendance or participation in schools or churches that are generally used by persons of a national origin group and because an individual's name or their spouse's name is associated with the national origin group even though that person may not belong to a particular national origin group. And when you talk about a national origin group, you know, what exactly do you mean? Well, obviously, a country, an identified political subdivision, uh, if someone is discriminated against because they're from that subdivision, then that's an obvious basis for discrimination because of national origin. But protection has been found even where no country was recognized, but there was nevertheless a distinct cultural or ethnic identity, such as, for example, gypsies or Cajuns. Uh, the claims of a Palestinian were entitled to protection despite the fact that there were uh, the non-existence of a state of Palestine. Um, in addition, um, uh, the existence of historical national entities is also supportive claims for national origin. For example, Serbians and Ukrainians have been protected under Title VII. Now, as you mentioned, the Supreme Court has really only addressed uh, the limits of the term national origin in one occasion, and that was in Espinoza uh, versus Farrah Manufacturing Company, where the court held, as you indicated, that Title VII doesn't protect against citizenship discrimination unless uh, the citizenship protection somehow has the result uh, or uh, the effect or uh, the purpose of national origin discrimination. should be clear that this isn't a question of, um, say, WASP versus persons from other national origins. Discrimination among people of different national origins, such as preferring, for example, a Cuban over an El Salvadoran, is uh, prohibited under Title VII. And one unique aspect of national origin discrimination has to do with rules that some employers have adopted uh, that relate to fluency in English requirements. The EEOC has addressed that. These kinds of rules tend to be, as, as diversity in the workplace increases, employers uh, have been more likely to promulgate such rules. And the EEOC uh, has taken the position that if you have an English only rule that's enforced at all times that is a burden um, term of employment and could, uh, could constitute discrimination on the basis of national origin. Uh, so such rules are closely scrutinized, 
um, and employers generally are allowed to have them only uh, during certain periods of time if they have a business justification for doing so and if they've put the employees on notice of uh, the existence or the consequences of violating such a rule. So I think those are the major uh, issues that one needs to be, that we see, I should say, most frequently under, uh, in the area of national origin discrimination. And I think it's actually interesting that while Title VII doesn't protect against discrimination on the basis of the country of one's citizenship, there may be other laws that do. And for instance, while we're not going into it, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 not only expands the Title VII prohibition against national origin discrimination to employers smaller than the 15-person limit that exists uh, in Title VII, but it prohibits discrimination in hiring and discharge uh, based on citizenship status, although there are some limitations. So uh, n almost none of these laws are uh, these days the only source of uh, pro protection against discrimination. Um, one of the other important grounds uh, protected against discrimination in Title VII is sex. Um, failure to uh, promote someone because they're a woman would be a clear violation of uh, that prohibition. Uh, some of the things that the sex, sex uh, does, does not refer to under Title VII anyway is sexual activity or practice. Uh, it, it does not prohibit discrimination on the basis of marital status. It does not prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, it is also subject to this BFOQ defense that we'll discuss later. Uh, and it also does prohibit discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. And uh, Jana has, um, would like to expand on that. Yeah, interestingly, uh, it took a while for it to become clear that the prohibition on the basis of sex does, in fact, extend to uh, discrimination based on pregnancy, uh, because the Supreme Court, in fact, held for a while under the original act that it didn't. But in 1978, Congress uh, took a uh, uh, hold of the situation and enacted the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which provides simply that the terms because of sex or on the basis of sex include uh, because of or on the basis of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, and further provided that women who are affected by those conditions must be treated the same for all employment-related purposes. Um, now, as Wendy mentioned, uh, we should all be cognizant of the fact that states have enacted uh, statutes uh, that go beyond the protections of Title VII in a number of areas, and, and one of those kinds of statutes um, have been those that provide special benefits for pregnant women. Um, and in a subsequent Supreme Court case, uh, California Federal Savings and Loan, the Supreme Court held that the Pregnancy Discrimination Act doesn't preempt those uh, in the statute in that case, which required employers to provide paid leave to female employees who were disabled by uh, pregnancy, childbirth, or related questions. So the, the, the P PDA said the court is really a floor beneath which pregnancy benefits may not drop, not a ceiling above which they may not um, uh, rise. But at the same time, I think it's important to know uh, that uh, the courts have generally not approved um, actions by employers that uh, discriminate um, in favor ordinarily of uh, pregnant women uh, against uh, uh, in, uh, to the disadvantage of males. Most issues under the PDA really revolve around whether a particular condition like abortion or infertility is related to pregnancy or childbirth and thus protected um, and whether a particular action taken by an employer was on the basis of pregnancy or childbirth um, and whether employee uh, misconduct uh, caused by or related to pregnancy or uh, alleged misconduct uh, was protected by the PDA. For example, whether an employee uh, who refused to treat an <coughs> HIV positive patient because she was concerned of the impact at that time, this was some years ago in her pregnancy, was protected by the PDA and the court in that uh, case held no, that she wasn't. Um, I think those are the major points relating to the PDA. Thanks. Uh, another ground uh, under Title VII is religious discrimination on the basis of religion. Uh, this prohibits discrimination because of all aspects of religious observance and practice as well as belief. And in a minute, Jana will talk a little bit about that. Under this provision, the employer has the duty to reasonably accommodate to an employee's or prospective employee's religious observance or practice 
if the employer can do so without undue hardship on the conduct of the employer's business. And uh, this as what uh, ground is also subject to the BFOQ defense, which we'll talk about later. Jana, do you want to expand a bit on the religious discrimination prohibition? Yeah, I think really the first uh, issue there is, is what do we mean by religion? And as a general proposition, the courts have handled the definition of religion in Title VII in much the same way that they handle the military service exemption based on religious beliefs. Um, and when they are dealing with the balance between religious rights and the First Amendment. Basically, in a nutshell, I think the employee has to show that they um, uh, are, have been discriminated against uh, based on a belief that is sincerely and deeply held. Um, and in that sense, the term religion is interpreted to include, for example, self-proclaimed Satanist, a refusal to sign forms related to drug testing when that was against a person's firmly held uh, religious beliefs uh, regarding uh, intrusions upon their physical self. It also obviously includes church affiliation, agnosticism, atheism, religious beliefs that aren't held by any church or even by one's own denomination, if they are sincerely and deeply held, are protected religious beliefs. And the term also extends to religious practices and observances and even personal dress and grooming observances. Um, and the interesting thing about religion is that in, in Title VII, there are other statutes that do this, but in Title VII, it is the only basis for discrimination where employers are not only are required to refrain from discrimination, but also required to accommodate uh, the religious beliefs or observances of their employees. Uh, the Supreme Court in um, uh, Trans World Airlines versus Hardison held, however, that this uh, requirement to accommodate does not require an employer to bear more than a de minimis cost to accommodate the employee's religious beliefs and uh, that requiring more would constitute an undue hardship, uh, which employers are not required to incur uh, under Title VII. Uh, in addition, uh, Trans World Airlines held that employers are not required to sort of carve out a special exception to their seniority systems uh, to allow employees uh, to get the work schedule that they want in order to take care of their religion if, you know, that would violate the, in that case, a collectively bargained uh, uh, um, seniority system. Um, there are a couple of places, as Wendy suggested earlier, where religious discrimination is permitted. Um, for example, religious institutions are permitted to discriminate uh, in employment decisions when an employee's conduct is inconsistent with the employer's religious beliefs. For example, in one case, uh, uh, an academy was allowed to terminate a pregnant, unmarried teacher uh, because in that religion, having sex outside of marriage violated uh, that school's code of conduct. But in another case, involving almost entirely the same set of facts, uh, the result was the opposite because there was a question of fact as to whether the termination was because of the premarital condition, um, uh, premarital fornication, which would have been a justifiable termination as being against the religion uh, of the academy, as opposed to pregnancy which would have been sex discrimination under Title VII and not a justifiable uh, termination. Uh, this exemption, uh, as that case indicates, does not apply to discrimination based on protected characteristics other than religion, such as sex, race, or disability. I'd like to just add one point, if I could, on that, and that is that an employer that discharges only pregnant women uh, and takes no action against the men who got them pregnant is engaging in sex discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Um, as you can tell, uh, the uh, scope of Title VII is very broad, and the grounds uh, for discrimination we've sp spoken about already, uh, the kinds of actions that are prohibited are very broad. Pro the statute prohibits discrimination in hiring, discharge with respect to compensation, terms, conditions, privileges of employment, promotion, tests, other selection criteria, employee benefits, training, work assignments, really the whole gamut. And it also prohibits um, employers and others who are covered from limiting, segregating, or classifying employees or applicants in any way that would deprive them or tend to deprive them of employment opportunities or otherwise adversely 
um, affect their status as an employee. Um, that's sort of uh, language is used really to cover uh, eventually almost any employment practice. Uh, employment agencies, in addition, are prohibited from failing or refusing to refer someone to employment based on one of these protected uh, characteristics, or in fact, from referring someone for employment based solely on one of these protected characteristics. Labor organizations are covered both as labor organizations and as if they are, uh, if a labor organization is an employer, large enough employer, it's covered as an employer, but labor organizations are um, separately prohibited from um, excluding or expelling anyone from um, membership or otherwise discriminating against someone, um, failing or refusing to hire, uh, refer someone to a position, uh, or causing or attempting to cause an employer to discriminate. And then training programs. Uh, anyone who runs training programs, basically including apprenticeship uh, programs, retraining, on-the-job uh, training programs, are prohibited from discriminating um, in admission to or employment or in any way in respect to the, uh, tra these training programs. It's also unlawful under Title VII and many of the other laws for um, an entity to discriminate against an employee or an applicant uh, because that person has opposed any practice made unlawful by the title. This is called the Opposition Clause. And it's also unlawful to retaliate against someone because the person has made a charge, testified, assisted, or participated in any manner in an investigation, proceeding, or hearing under this title. That's called the Participation Clause. Uh, title VII also specifically uh, addresses uh, uh, discrimination in the printing or publication of notices or advertisements. There's limitations on the content. Um, ex um, and um, now I mentioned before, excuse me, that there are some statutory defenses for gender, religion, or national origin, but not for race or color the employer may or the other entities may be able to establish a BFOQ, bona fide occupational qualification. That's when uh, one of these factors, say religion, is, can be established as a factor in an employment decision, legitimate factor, um, if it is reasonably necessary to the normal operation of that particular business or enterprise. However, um, it is very narrowly construed and, in effect, the uh, employer needs to be able to establish that all or practically all of the people in the protected category must be excluded um, in order for um, their normal uh, business operation. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Customer preference, for example, is not a BFOQ. Um, however, gender-specific requirements for employment in professional sports generally is a BFOQ. There's another defense, which is in Section 703H of this Title VII, which has to do with bona fide seniority systems and uh, that were not adopted with the intention to discriminate. Uh, those um, and the consequences of them are valid even if they perpetuate the effects of prior discrimination. In Title VII cases, there's a wide range of remedies. Um, in all cases, we'll be uh, Injunctive relief may be appropriate. Attorney's fees and costs can be awarded. Affirmative action, um, as may be appropriate, uh, such things as reinstatement or hiring of employees with or without back pay. Uh, these are typical remedies in Title VII cases, as well as other equitable relief, giving someone the uh, promotion that they should have had. Um, now, I want to make a comment about um, these back pay and make whole remedies that are typical in Title VII. There is a presumption in Title VII in favor of back pay if discrimination is found and in favor of injunctive relief. One of the purposes of Title VII is to make victims whole. The courts have sort of uh, crafted something called rightful pl place relief um, is the principle to sort of implement the make whole concept. Uh, back pay typically includes what you would imagine, wage or salary, regular or anticipated wage increases that would have occurred during the period, overtime pay that you would a victim would have earned, commission earning, shift differentials, bonuses, fringe payments, sick and annual leave that the person would have earned, pension benefits they would have earned, medical expenses that they incurred that they wouldn't have incurred if in a, in a discharge case if they hadn't lost their job. Um, expenses for job search. In effect, um, it's to make the individual whole for the losses, the monetary losses that they um, incurred. Uh, they also may, uh, back pay awards may 
um, have prejudge prejudgment interest may be awarded on back pay awards. Now the victim does have the duty to mitigate back pay losses and the uh, amount will be um, reduced by any interim earnings or an amount which could have been earned by using reasonable diligence to find substantially equivalent employment. There is a conflict in the courts about whether such uh, monies as unemployment compensation uh, and certain other kinds of benefits, uh, pension benefits, um, should be subtracted uh, from back pay or whether they are basically from a collateral source which is not something that should be uh, deducted from back pay. Uh, by the way, there is a two-year limit um, under Title VII. Back pay may not be awarded to a date more than two years prior to the date of the filing of the EEOC charge. Um, in, in certain Title VII cases, uh, those that involved uh, intentional discrimination, which is not all Title VII cases as we'll discuss, the statute in 1991 was amended to provide for an award of compensatory damages and in some cases punitive damages. Compensatory damages include damages for f future pecuniary losses, emotional pain, suffering, inconvenience, mental anguish, loss of enjoyment of life, um, and punitive damages can be awarded against um, in cases of malice or reckless indifference. Now there is um, are caps on the dollar amount of compensatory and punitive damages that can be awarded based on the size of the employer. Uh, I think uh, before we go on to talk about the theories of discrimination, Jana probably um, can talk a little bit about sexual harassment and the uh, many interesting developments in that area. One thing I'd, I'd like uh, any of the panelists to comment on, and that is uh, especially in light of these these caps that apply, the damage caps that uh, grow larger depending upon the increased size of the employer's workforce. The, the uh, litigation that you've seen in the area of, of uh, single employer or joint employer uh, designed to, uh, on the part of plaintiffs, to expand the size of the employer in order to raise the, the caps. Any comments from any of the panelists on that? Yes, there's a wide variety of viewpoints among the circuits on what kind of evidence is enough and what a court should look at to see whether the uh, employment relationship is a joint employment relationship. Many circuits follow the traditional National Labor Relations Board test with the uh, eight factors, I believe it is, that the NLRB looks to. The Seventh Circuit uh, has its own set of standards, and uh, there is a substantial amount of variation. There's really not time to get into the ins and outs. There also are situations where you have ratification of uh, uh, a subsidiaries or franchisees' actions. The employer may be res the uh, franchisor may have uh, some toll-free number for sexual harassment. It may have sexual harassment policies, for example, that they insist the franchisees follow, and they uh, are trying to make sure the franchisees do not get into trouble. But they themselves then take over that part of the personnel operation and may become accountable. Pete, that, but that really points up um, some of the danger of, of importing principles that were developed for one purpose and using them for another. The, the caps on damages really were related to essentially looking at the size of the employer and what would be an appropriate penalty for that size employer. Um, and so if you have a defendant, the fact that you may find someone as a, as a joint employer for certain purposes of, of evidentiary purposes um, or liability purposes, the question is who are you assessing the damages against? Is that an entity which was envisioned by Congress to be subject to the higher limits? Shall we go to sexual harassment? Let's okay. move right on. <laughs> um, this also uh, is sort of a, a relatively late comer in terms of judicial approval uh, under Title VII. Uh, sexual harassment was recognized as a form of sex discrimination uh, for the first time by the Supreme Court in 1986 in uh, the case of Meritor Savings Bank versus Vinson. And since then, um, uh, well, actually, the EEOC, perhaps even prior to then, I'm not entirely sure about that, had promulgated guidelines to define harassment as taking basically one of two forms. The first one was called quid pro quo harassment, and that basically included um, unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature when submission to that conduct was made a uh, term or condition of the individual's employment or was used as the basis for employment decisions. Um, 
the, the other form of sexual harassment uh, was called uh, basically hostile working environment harassment. Um, and that involved sex-based unwelcome conduct that had the purpose or effect of unreasonably interfering with an individual's work performance or creating an intimidating, hostile, uh, or offensive working environment. Now, those two sort of forms uh, of harassment, the distinction between them has been obliterated as far as assessing liability against employers is concerned by two fairly recent Supreme Court decisions uh, in Farragher and Ellerth, and that was in 1998. Um, in this, these two cases really changed dramatically the ground rules for assessing uh, liability in sex harassment cases. And just to spend a moment on them, because they are so important and they do really lay out the foundation for much of what's happening in sexual harassment right now and in the litigation. Um, in that case, the Supreme Court reason really applying the aided in the agency provisions of the restatement and agency, that an employer is going to be strictly liable for harassment um, of any kind created by a supervisor who has uh, immediate or successively higher authority over the harassed employee, even if the employer uh, and their management has no knowledge that the harassment is going on. It's basically a strict uh, liability kind of situation if that supervisor's harassment culminates in a tangible employment action, an adverse action generally, such as a discharge or demotion or an undesirable assignment. And in that kind of situation, the employer is liable, there's no defense available. If, however, no tangible is action is taken, uh, which is uh, maybe the case if a supervisor is involved and is almost always the case if a supervisor is not involved, then the employer has an affirmative defense to liability for sexual harassment. And, and in order to take advantage of that defense, um, it has to prove two things. The first thing really has two parts to it. The employer has to show that it exercised reasonable care to prevent and reasonable care to promptly correct sexually harassing behavior. Um, the second prong is if the employer establishes the first one, the employer must also establish that the employee in question unreasonably fail to take advantage of the corrective and preventive measures that the employer had in place or fail to uh, take a, a reasonable efforts to avoid harm otherwise. Now, um, that raises several different questions. The first one is, did the harassment result in a tangible job detriment? If it didn't, uh, then the employer at least may have the opportunity to assert uh, uh, the affirmative defense. So we get to the question of what is a tangible job deference, uh, detriment and in the Supreme Court decisions the court said that it's generally looking at a significant change in employment status such as hiring, uh, firing, failing to promote uh, or decisions causing a significant change in benefits. Uh, the court was careful to uh, note with approval some decisions by earlier some earlier decisions by circuit courts holding that things like a, a bruised ego or a reassignment to a less convenient job or a demotion without any change in pay duties, benefits, and prestige was not a tangible job detriment, that it would take more than that. Since uh, Farragher and Ellerth, uh, this has been a, a topic of considerable litigation and controversy in the circuit courts. I would say that for the most part, uh, the courts are, are adhering to the language of the Supreme Court and finding that a tangible job detriment occurred only when there was a change in position or status that had present or in some cases potential adverse economic uh, consequences. But as I'm sure Rick would be quick to point out, that is not uh, always the case. Um, then, you know, if you have a tangible job detriment, again, it, it has to have culminated in harassment. And the plaintiff basically has to show um, that, um, that, uh, that it did so. Um, and usually you do do that in, in, in accordance with the typical burden shifting pattern of proof in discrimination cases. Uh, that is, the plaintiff would show that, the, that uh, a prima facie case of discrimination, the employer, if they could show a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the tangible job detriment that had nothing to do with harassment, um, 
would do so and then the plaintiff is able to show evidence uh, that, this, that those reasons are pretextual and that in fact the real reason uh, was, uh, re was the culmination of harassment. If I could just interject one thing as you uh, had predicted, uh, there are some courts that have held that a significant uh, uh, negative uh, effect in status or prestige of the individual will constitute a tangible job detriment because that is an employer action. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, obviously the person who uh, uh, engages in this uh, tangible job detriment usually is a, is a supervisor and that's who we're talking about here. Um, and there are questions that arise as to whether an individual um, falls within the definition of a supervisor. I would say that as a general proposition, the courts apply about the same standard in this context in Title VII cases as they apply in National Labor Relations Act cases and looking at whether somebody is a supervisor. Usually if they've got the authority to hire, fire, promote, demote, transfer, or discipline, uh, that's going to amount to a supervisory status and in some cases even if they have uh, they don't have that authority directly, but have the authority to effectively recommend those actions, then that will be enough. Now, uh, uh, if um, there is uh, no tangible uh, uh, job detriment, um, then the employer may have the opportunity to establish this uh, reasonable care defense, uh, uh, where he must show that he took reasonable care to prevent and correct the alleged harassment. Uh, there are, this has been the, I guess, one of the fastest growing uh, areas of litigation that we've seen uh, in recent years. Um, generally, in establishing that you've taken, I guess the first point I should make is that the courts insist that the employers show both that they have tried to take reasonable steps to prevent and to correct the harassment. Just correcting it after the fact is not enough. Um, in terms of prevention, um, the first thing the courts usually look for is whether or not the employer had a policy prohibiting harassment. Although, as the Supreme Court said in Farragher and Ellerth, um, a policy may be addressed, but it's not necessarily required. In some smaller, smaller companies, uh, that might not be an absolute required element of the defense, but in most cases it has been. Um, um, the policy statement uh, also, uh, the, the courts are going to require that the employer have uh, acted to get the word about its policy out. Uh, even if the plaintiff knows about the policy, liability is going to attach if the policy was not really an effective preventative program. Um, and there are a number of cases that have addressed whether a particular policy, whether the employer's uh, attempts to perpetuate that policy were enough to an allow it to take advantage of the um, affirmative defense. Um, with respect to uh, showing reasonable care in the correction of harassment, the issues focus on whether the employer did a, a proper investigation uh, and whether if it concluded that harassment had occurred, whether uh, it did, uh, it, it effectively remedied the harassment and did what it, it should in that uh, area. Um, in general, um, it, with respect to the employee's unreasonable failure to take advantage of those preventive or corrective opportunities uh, provided by the employer, the second major prong of the defense, um, the courts have uh, begun to look at these issues um, and, and the, the question really focuses on generally whether if, if the employer had a grievance procedure or a complaint procedure, whether the employee had a good reason for not taking advantage of it. And in general, if the policy was a good one, it was an effective one, and if it had been promulgated uh, and enforced effectively in the past, then the courts are going to find that the employee's failure to use it cannot be justified just based on mere rumors that it's not effective or uh, beliefs that they would be retaliated against for complaining under the procedure or that their complaints wouldn't be taken seriously unless they had some, some good um, uh, evidence to support that uh, kind of belief. I think it should be noted that these principles apply not just to sexual harassment, uh, but they apply to other forms of harassment as well. The Supreme Court suggested that would be the case, and uh, it has, in fact, uh, been so held in a number of cases since Ellerth 
and uh, Farragher. Uh, it's, it, we should note that in sexual harassment, you have various other elements of the claim. First of all, the plaintiff has to prove that the harassment was based on sex. And a number of issues have arisen on, on that uh, question. First of all, was whether uh, harassment uh, by a male against a male uh, could be prohibited or was covered by Title VII. And the court held that in on the on-call case on Kale versus Sundowner Offshore Services um, in 1998, uh, that same-sex harassment is actionable under Title VII, but not harassment based on sexual preference. Um, uh, in um, another issue that arises in terms of was the, was the harassment based on sex relates to this, what we call the equal opportunity offender, the person who uh, basically harasses both males and females in the same way. Um, and I think it's fairly clear that uh, that kind of harassment, where someone is just generally nasty to all of the people uh, they supervise, for example, is, is not actionable under Title VII. But there are a lot of issues out there about whether the language used uh, or the circumstances uh, would suggest that the conduct was in fact sex-based sex or had the effect, uh, a more harsh effect on women than on men. Uh, on the harassment has to be unwelcome um, and that is assessed uh, based in a very individualized way based on the facts and circumstances of each case. Questions come up about whether, for example, an affair was consensual uh, such that you know the, it was not in fact harassment um, and about whether or not the plaintiff in the case in fact engaged in the same kind of offensive sex-based behavior as her alleged harasser did. Um, and there's some a lot of cases that examine those principles. The other big issue in harassment has to do with when the harassment is sufficiently severe and pervasive, and we're talking here about hostile work environment harassment, to enable a plaintiff to establish a case without showing the tangible job action uh, that we talked about earlier. And um, again, uh, the courts are clear that the harassment must be severe or pervasive enough to show to create an environment that a reasonable person would find hostile and abusive and that also is subjectively perceived by the plaintiff uh, to be abusive. The factors that the courts look at in assessing this were discussed at length in Harris versus Forklift Systems, a case decided by the Supreme Court back in the early 90s. Um, and basically, the court held there that you have to look at circumstances such as the frequency of the conduct, how severe it was, whether it was physically threatening or humiliating as opposed to being a mere offensive utterance, uh, and whether it unreasonably interfered with an employee's work performance, and in some cases, did it result in uh, psychological harm. But none of these elements are essential to a determination um, that the conduct amounted to sexual harassment. Uh, they're all, however, uh, relevant. Um, that is a pretty quick and dirty harass, uh, overview of harassment uh, with, uh, with just two further points. Uh, harassment by coworkers is is prohibited just as is harassment by supervisors and where the harassment involves uh, co-worker harassment the courts apply generally a negligent standard did the employee complain or give notice and if not was it reasonable and once if the employer had notice of it did they give a prompt and effective remedial risk measure in addition harassment by third parties customers uh, patients for example in a hospital may be uh, uh, illegal as well Wendy uh, Jana mentioned uh, that uh, in the sexual harassment cases, she discussed one of the typical methods of approving a case. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the theories of discrimination that have developed under Title VII, uh, but are applicable also to most of the other discrimination statutes that um, um, are out there, some of which we're talking about today. Uh, the first uh, theory is the disparate treatment or intentional discrimination. And uh, this is unlawful under Title VII when it's based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin under the Age Discrimination Act when based on age, under the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act when based on disability. Um, and it's the most easily understood of uh, probably the kinds of discrimination, which is that the employer simply treats some people uh, in a protected class or a prote an individual less favorably than others because of 
um, this criteria. Now, proof of discriminatory motive is critical. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, inferred from the mere fact of differences in treatment, and some of our other colleagues here will be talking about this. Uh, usually, the finding of um, uh, intention to discriminate is there are sort of two major ways of establishing it. One, uh, and probably the less frequent way, is with direct evidence of intentional discrimination. This would be something like a policy that says women are not allowed in this job, or um, uh, blacks should get fewer benefits than whites, you, and, or uh, there's an age limit on uh, how old you have to be or must be to transfer to a certain positions. Those kinds of things. They don't happen too often anymore, but they do. The rebuttal to such kinds of um, evidence would either be a, uh, disputing the existence of the policy or uh, if there is a statutory defense such as a, a BFOQ that we talked about before uh, or in the age discrimination there are some statutory defenses, that can be raised. The more typical method of um, also another kind of direct evidence might be um, statements by high level decision makers demonstrating bias against the plaintiff with regard to whatever the decision at issue was, such as the supervisor's comments that someone's problems had to do with her age and entry into menopause, and then takes an action uh, relating to that. Um, the rebuttal of these kinds of evidence is usually either dis disputing the factual showing um, or trying to establish that the comments were not made close in time to the uh, challenged action or demonstrating that the employer would have reached the decision in the same, um, in the absence of that. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, or if there is a statutory defense, raising the statutory defense. Um, the more typical uh, theory of discrimination uh, is one in which the plaintiff must rely, the parties, on circumstantial evidence, not direct evidence. Um, and th as a result of a series of Supreme Court cases, um, there is a burden-shifting analysis which is known fondly or not so fondly as the McDonnell Douglas Verdine, and then there's some other cases that are sometimes mentioned, Hicks, Reeves, uh, burden shifting analysis, which is the three-step process that uh, Jana mentioned earlier, which um, first of all, the plaintiff must establish a prima facie case of discrimination. In the case of a refusal to hire, for example, this would be that the uh, plaintiff was within the protected class, that she sought, was qualified for the position that the employer was hiring. Uh, she was rejected for the position and that the employer continued to seek applicants and, and uh, gave the position to uh, someone of similar or lesser qualifications. Uh, the burden of establishing a prima facie case is not onerous. Um, and then uh, the burden shifts to the defendant to articulate a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for its action. All the defendant has to do is ad introduce admissible evidence which, if believed by the trier of fact, would support a finding that something other than discrimination motivated the challenged employment decision. And this burden is only a burden of production on the defendant, not a burden of persuasion. Uh, then the third step is that the burden again shifts to the plaintiff, and at this final stage the plaintiff has the opportunity to prove by a preponderance of the evidence um, that the non-discriminatory reasons that are offered by the employer were not the true reasons, but merely a pretext for discrimination. So in much of the litigation, the uh, revolves around uh, what kind of evidence the plaintiff must show to satisfy the burden um, at this pretext stage of the analysis. And um, Rick and um, I think Rick, one of our yeah. colleagues will be <laughs> discussing. Mark, okay, we'll be discussing this in a lot in a greater detail. Wendy, I'm, I'm, I think that uh, before we we uh, conclude this part of the program, I really would would like to have Jana address the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and uh, and the the issues that that are likely to come before federal judges and law clerks, especially by virtue of of. Uh, of the filing of summary judgment motions because of the number of hurdles that a plaintiff has to jump over uh, to prove a case of disability discrimination under the ADA Title I. Sure, I'd be happy to uh, appear. Um, the ADA basically prohibits employers from discriminating against um, uh, qualified individuals with 
a disability. It differs uh, in that it doesn't prohibit discrimination on the basis of a characteristic uh, that everyone has. It singles out a particular group of people, those who are qualified, notwithstanding the fact that they have a disability. In addition, uh, this law requires that employers make reasonable accommodations for the disability of a qualified applicant or employee, if doing so would allow that person to perform the essential functions of the job that he or she is seeking. And of course, this leads to a lot of subsets of questions. Uh, in to order to make out a complaint, uh, the individual first of all has to show that they have a disability. Um, and if they uh, are unable to do so, and this is a question that comes up frequently on summary judgment uh, decisions, uh, then they are not able to proceed with their claim. Now, what's a disability? Uh, it is uh, a multi-part definition. I think most of the things I've talked about today have had multiple parts, but um, uh, the statute defines a disability as a, first of all, a, a physical or mental impairment uh, that has a uh, substantial limiting effect on a person's ability to carry out a major life activity. Uh, it also includes a record of such a disability or, a, or being regarded as having such a disability even if the person does not have it. Um, the, the impairment part basically refers to uh, a phys uh, physiological disorder or condition or cosmetic disfigurement or an anatomical loss uh, that affects one or more of the body systems. Uh, mental impairments also are covered. Um, and uh, that is uh, obviously a, an area of much debate about what qualifies as a, a mental impairment. There's a lot of case law on that. Um, the EEOC refers um, uh, um, complainants and employers uh, to the American Psychiatric Association's uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders uh, uh, as being relevant for identifying those disorders. Now, there are some conditions that are not covered. Illegal drug use is not covered, uh, although people who've participated in or are participating in a, a supervised rehab program are no, and are no longer engaging in the illegal use of drugs uh, are covered. And then there are some statutory exclusions of certain um, um, types of, of conditions, uh, such as bisexuality, transvesticism, and so forth and so on. Uh, those are, are listed in the statute. The EEOC has said physical characteristics, personality traits, just having cultural disadvantages, those are not disabilities. Um, and pregnancy uh, is not a disability, nor is a simple just predisposition uh, to illness or sickliness. Uh, the courts have also focused on whether impairments that were really temporary in nature were covered, and generally they are not. Um, but assuming the person is, has an impairment, they also have to show that that impairment substantially limits them in a major life activity. Major life activities have been interpreted pretty broadly by the EEOC, um, and the Supreme Court has in interpreted that term to include reproduction, so that an individual who was uh, infected uh, with HIV uh, was substantially limited in the major life activity of reproduction and was therefore covered by uh, the ADA. Uh, that impairment, though, as I said, has to be substantially limiting. Um, and in that, in it, determining whether it is, uh, factors such as its nature and severity, how long it's expected to last, whether it's permanent or has a long-term impact uh, is, goes, are factored in. There's also an issue of, well, what if the impairment has been mitigated or the effects of it have been mitigated, through, uh, medicated uh, or otherwise corrected as through glasses or, or some other mitigating um, a measure? And the Supreme Court has held that, um, that uh, in, in, in assessing whether uh, an individual is substantially limited, uh, the court can and should take into account any measures that the individual has taken to correct for or mitigate a physical or Im mental impairment. And if it has been mitigated uh, then and is no longer substantially limiting because of that mitigation or medication, then the person is not uh, covered. Um, 
Uh, there are also questions that I'm not going to get into but have to do with uh, whether someone is substantially limited in the major life activity of working because that is a question unto itself. Um, then, as I mentioned, whether if one has a record of an impairment or is just regarded as having one, they would also be covered. But in both of those analyses, it's important to look at both of the prongs. The person has to have a record of an impairment that uh, was, is substantially limiting in a major life activity or has to have been regarded as having not just an impairment but one that is substantially limiting. From there you go to whether the person is a qualified individual with a disability because it's not enough just to be disabled. One has to show that they would be able to do the job, notwithstanding the disability, the essential functions of the job, if reasonable accommodations are made. This leads you into the question of what are the essential functions of the job in question, uh, whether the employee can perform them notwithstanding their disability, their impairment, if not, whether a reasonable accommodation would enable the employee to do so, and if so, whether the accommodation would, rec would result in undue hardship to the employer. And I think that probably each of us have seen countless cases on each one of those separate issues that you've raised, uh, and, and uh, there's no end in sight. I think you would agree with me. Absolutely. Uh, there's plenty of uh, fodder for litigation in all of that. Well, in fact, the statute env envisions that it be a case-by-case -case analysis, which requires that. Right. Well, we have had um, a, a uh, brief, uh, uh, fact-packed, uh, concept-packed overview of the substance of equal employment opportunity uh, law litigation, and now we're going to move into um, the procedural portion of our program. Um, and uh, Rick Seymour and Mark Dichter are going to be responsible for presenting that. Uh, Rick is going to conclude that. We're going to move backwards in this uh, order with uh, a discussion about the remedies available under the employment uh, laws and uh, attorney's fees um, if uh, if the courts ever get that far, and, uh, and a, a certain number of courts have. Uh, in the middle section, Mark is going to cover the discovery issues, summary judgment, and evidentiary issues. And Rick, you're going to start off with talking about administrative procedures, exhaustion of remedies, uh, and timeliness. So without further ado, Rick Seymour. Okay. Uh, for many of the fair employment statutes that uh, one sees in litigation, there's a requirement that a charge of discrimination be filed with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And uh, I'll try to go point by point, but there's a lot of uh, uh, complexity in the field. The main purpose of the charge filing requirement is to give the employer notice, or the union, or the employment agency, whoever is charged, uh, notice uh, that there is a charge, and to give the agency that receives the charge the opportunity to do an investigation, see if there's potential merit to the charge, and if there looks like potential merit, a chance to uh, conciliate it. This is not just an idle activity. The EEOC receives about 86,000 charges of discrimination a year. There are only about 21,000 lawsuits filed in federal courts per year. Uh, so there is a major winnowing that takes place inside the administrative process. The um, Supreme Court is going to be deciding this term whether a charging party must swear to the charge within the original period of time for filing the charge or whether an unsworn charge is going to be sufficient and uh, under the EEOC regulations the person can sometime thereafter, but outside of the charge filing per, uh, period, cure the defect of as not having been verified. Once the EEOC receives a charge, statutorily it's required to provide notice to the employer within 10 days. The important thing about uh, the EEOC process with respect to the private sector and state and local government sector uh, as opposed to the federal sector, which I'll talk about at the end, is that it's an investigative process, not an adjudicative process. The EEOC does not issue findings of fact and conclusions of law. It's not reviewed on the record. Uh, trials with respect to what the EEOC decides or does not decide are completely de novo, and an individual can sue whether or not the EEOC has actually reached an issue. The EEOC process, uh, once the charge is in, and often before much investigation has taken place, is to make uh, alternative dispute resolution available to many of the charging parties and respondents. 
Uh, this mediation process occurs only if both sides agree to it, but there are a substantial number of cases that do get resolved through that mediation. As the EEOC uh, goes on with this investigation, it's got the authority to request the employer to provide information. It can request a charging party for more information. Uh, it can interview witnesses. If someone fails to provide the information that has been requested, it can issue an administrative subpoena. And if the uh, person receiving the subpoena declines to respond to that, then it can go into federal court to seek enforcement. The EEOC process ends with uh, a reasonable cause determination, which is not a finding of discrimination. It is simply that based upon the investigation it did, the EEOC finds reasonable cause to believe that the allegations of the charge are true, uh, or else it does not. If it finds that there is cause, the EEOC then invites the parties to conciliate and resolve the matter, or the EEOC, uh, if that conciliation fails, the EEOC can then file suit uh, and uh, try to uh, obtain relief based upon the information in the charge. Now, the EEOC and all other federal enforcement agencies file only between four and 500 lawsuits per year in federal district courts. That means that about 20,500 are filed by private parties. Uh, the, uh, if there is no suit by the EEOC in a reasonable cause case, the EEOC issues a notice of right to sue. If the EEOC concludes its process and uh, cannot determine that there is cause, it issues a notice of right to sue. There is a substantial amount of litigation taking place about what happens when the EEOC has not had the charge for the full 180 days contemplated by the statute and it has not completed its process and the charging party requests an early notice of right to sue. Now after the 180 days are up,